Over the past few months that I've lived in London, I've been on a mission to learn as much as I can about the places I frequent every day. As both a filmmaker and future doctor, I've been trying to uncover the local history around me at the smallest level. The microbiological one. We as a society have been dealing with illness and disease for as long as we've been here. So the question has always been, how do we survive? How do we adapt and progress? And those answers rely on scientific breakthroughs, research, and developments. Navigating public locations in a post-pandemic world, many of us are more aware of the ways we interact with surfaces and spaces. At the end of the day, London is a petri dish and we're all living in it. But where did our modern epidemiological practices originate? To gain a better understanding of present and future scientific developments, I believe it's important to revisit the past. London has its own unique story of scientific progress, discoveries that happened in the areas I walked through as a student. My quest for uncovering history has led me through one of my favorite neighborhoods, Soho. Back in the 19th century, the deadly, incurable disease known commonly as cholera was spreading like wildfire throughout London. Let's take a look. Lots of people were dying. Back then, there was no widely accepted germ theory. Rather, most people believed in miasma, the belief that poisonous, foul-smelling air caused diseases like cholera. People even donned contraptions like this as a means to protect themselves. Since Koch's germ theory of disease would come decades later, the scientific community still relied on theories of miasma for answers at this time. In 1854, an outbreak of cholera was sweeping through London, and as people continued dying, one physician, Dr. John Snow, went on a quest to lay it all out. With the help of a local priest, Henry Whitehead, Snow embarked through the streets of Soho. Sir, as soon as I became acquainted with the situation and extent of the late outbreak of cholera in Broad Street, Golden Square, and the adjoining streets, I suspected some contamination of the water of the much frequented street pump in Broad Street. I find myself walking along a similar journey now. On proceeding to the spot, I found that nearly all the deaths had taken place within a short distance of the pump. Through this method, he began compiling data about local deaths and analyzing his information for patterns. Snow created his famous maps of Soho, showing the cholera victims and nearby water suppliers. With regard to the deaths occurring in the locality belonging to the pump, there were 61 instances in which I was informed that the deceased persons used to drink the pump water from Broad Street, either constantly or occasionally. The result of the inquiry then is that there has been no particular outbreak or prevalence of cholera in this part of London, except among the persons who are in the habit of drinking the water of the above mentioned pump well. Looking at his maps, they presented a newfound explanation. Contrary to the popular belief that miasma spread cholera, snow pointed to one of the central water pumps. These communal pumps directed streams of water into the city for public use. They served large areas and communities, and through snow's revolutionary epidemiological methods, he discovered this water pump was the common denominator of cholera victims in Soho. I had an interview with the Board of Guardians of St. James's Parish. In consequence of what I said, the handle of the pump was removed on the following day.
In two or three days after the use of the water was discontinued, the number of fresh attacks became very few. While Snow was successful in having the pump removed, it didn't mean his theories were necessarily widely accepted at first. Many still rejected his ideas that water could transmit disease. Nevertheless, Snow's maps still hold great importance to not only London, but worldwide, as they represent the move towards modern epidemiological practices. Coming to London, my goal was to find ways to explore science within my new city. I wasn't sure what that would look like, but as always, I stayed determined to find an intersection between my passions. While studying at Birkbeck's School of the Arts, I found myself in close proximity to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, home to various scientists, epidemiologists, and researchers. In rural areas, and you, and it's brilliant. I had the it chance to sit down with Professor Paul Fine, an epidemiologist think. there, and one of the founders of the John Snow Society. According to their website, the Society aims to promote the life and works of Dr. John Snow, the pioneer of epidemiological method and celebrated anesthetist. The group is responsible for installing the replica of the Broad Street water pump, which sits outside the John Snow pub. Alongside Paul, I also had the opportunity to view past visitor logs at the pub, which any patrons can sign just like I did, if you know where to look. The Society also holds annual pump handle lecture series around the anniversary of the pump's removal in September. Speakers have included the likes of British epidemiologist Andy Haynes to Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, just to name a few. The John Snow Society, which I'm now proudly a part of, boasts over 4,200 lifelong members. Here's my official membership card. I'm number 4,270, and I'm looking forward to attending next year's Pump Handle Lecture and to continue developing my knowledge. As I wrap up my time in London, I reflect on the numerous trips I've taken to museums, libraries, and locations throughout the city. It's been such a satisfying experience to expand my education outside of the classroom and across the pond. Along the way, my quest to fuse science and the arts has led me to meet some of the most interesting people and join a global society of epidemiologists and science lovers alike. Don't you want a cool mug like mine? <laughs>